My name is Amalia Weber. I'm the program specialist here at Rochester Hills Public Library, and I'd like to welcome you to this evening's Smart Towns program, Patton, American War Gener Warrior General. Before we get started, I'd like to take care of a few housekeeping details. Firstly, tonight's program will be recorded and available to view about one week from tonight on our YouTube page and on the RHPL website shortly after. We ask that audience members please silence or turn off their cell phones before we begin in order to avoid any disturbances during the presentation. Even if you think it's off, it's never a bad idea to check. Our next program is Vaping 101, an informational program presented by Oakland County Health, which will be an in-person event on Thursday, March 21st at 7 p.m. You can sign up for that at calendar.rhpl.org. Tonight's program is presented in partnership with Smart Towns, a lifelong learning program for everyone in the community, led by educational organizations in Rochester, Rochester Hills, and Oakland Township, Michigan. Smart Towns offers lectures, presentations, and courses that introduce the participants to all aspects of the topic and are presented by experts in their respective fields of study. Just a note that if you enjoyed tonight's program with Frank Cardamon, he is going to be coming back for another couple lectures this year. He is scheduled for May 30th, where he will be presenting The Man Who Never Was about the Sicilian Campaign and Deception Plan. And he will also be here on June 4th to talk about uh, D-Day on the 80 year anniversary of D-Day. And now, without further ado, please welcome our presenter, Frank Cardamon. Can you hear me okay? Is that all right? Good. Welcome. I'm glad to be with you again. I see a few faces in here that I've seen at previous programs. My name's Frank Cardamon. I come to you as a historian of about 60 years on World War II, particularly European campaign. I'm a professor at Oakland University in the business school, which is kind of unusual, eh? But anyhow, um, when I was 22, a year after I got married, I saw a movie on Hitler, and I could not understand how the German people could follow this guy. I mean, the Germans were the most proficient, most efficient, most religious, and they followed this guy to where at the end of World War II, we had anywhere from 60 to 75 million people dead. 30% of them were children and innocent people. You came to hear Patton tonight. That's not Patton. That's my uncle. His wife was my godmother, and he stood up for me when I did my confirmation. So they're very close to us. He was in World War II in the 45th Division. And I want to take you back to when I was 17, in 1956, 57 time frame, 12 years after the war is over. We went out to see my aunt and uncle, and he was sitting at the table around 11 o'clock in the morning. And I ran into the house and I said, Uncle Joe, you aren't going to believe, I just read this book about Patton. I said, it's the most incredible book. The man was an incredible genius. He was the greatest commander we had. And I'm telling you, I want to learn more about this. There was this grin on his face. And he said, you mean old blood and guts? And I said, yeah, that's what they called him. The story ends there. He died when he was 55, probably caused by the war because the 45th started in Northern Africa, went to Sicily, went to Sardinia, went to Rome, went to Anzio for three months, went through Rome itself, went up to Florence, did an amphibious landing in southern France, went up through the west of the Vosges Mountains, connected with Patton coming across the third, went into Germany and Nuremberg, and ended up with the war in Dachau. I'm going to take you on a couple of those journeys. He was one of the few people that survived his company. 
Now, I tell you this story to start with because it wasn't until 2012 that I did a one-year research on all of his documents that he had in this box. And I read the 45th Division's analysis of the war and made contacts with people in Oklahoma where the headquarters are to find out where this man went to and what he did. I know exactly where he was on certain dates. I can tell you exactly where he was. When he went into Sicily, he went in with Patton. I did not know that until 2012. So that morning, when he said, yeah, oh, blood and guts, he knew that I was talking about that guy. Now, I always love the quote, the object of war is not to die for your country, but to make the other bastard die for his. Okay? That's pretty interesting, isn't it? Before I continue, I want to tell you that I have not been in the military service, but I have been a historian for over 50 years. I want to ask, are there any World War II veterans in here tonight? I, I don't think so. We're losing almost all of them now. How about any veterans in here tonight? You want to stand up? Thank you very much. Stand up. Yeah. Thank you. I'm going to tell you a story about George Patton. Some of the stuff you already know, I bet some of it you don't know, though. And so that's what my object is tonight in sharing with you. In his early years, born in California, uh, father was a colonel in the South, Civil War. Came from a wealthy family. The family money came from lumber. And it, one, one article I read sounded like they owned L.A. The whole area of L.A. was the property that they owned. So we're talking about a very wealthy family and certainly was one of the wealthiest, if not the wealthiest, military officer <laughs> in the U.S. Army. Uh, early school years, difficulty in reading, spelling. He had dyslexia, didn't know what it was at the time. Former education, he had private tutoring around 11 because he wasn't doing very well, so they had to improve his uh, status. Became a voracious reader, primarily of Hannibal, of Caesar, of all of the great military leaders. That was his interest level. He spent one year at VMI and then was entered into the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. Now, he had to repeat his pleb year because he didn't do so well. And he graduated on June 9, 1909, second lieutenant cavalry. And he came 42nd out of, I think, 109. But he came in 42nd in terms of his ranking. He married a beautiful girl, Beatrice Ayer. He believed in reincarnation, highly believed in reincarnation. And he believed all through the war, up until the time he died, that he had been in certain wars. And he was convinced of it. He was anti-Semitic. He was a military warrior with a foul language. And when you see this man, how big he is, he's six foot two, and how strong he is, and look, his voice was like Rocky Marciano. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, very high pitched. I mean, it was like you couldn't believe it was coming from this man. So very unusual. But I want to go back to, oh, I didn't put that in there in this piece. Yeah, oh yes I did. Military warrior with a foul language. Very foul, okay? We'll get some of that later. I believe one of the greatest field commanders in American history, certainly a military leader, four star, is believed to have narcissistic personality disorder, disorders just like all of the military leaders thought that they were so great. There's a picture of his wedding, picture of his class. Can you point him out in his class? <laughs> <laughs> I think, I can't. I, I thought it was right down there, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure. What most of you don't know is that he was a pentathlon competitor in 1912. That's 112 years ago. In five events, 
And he was very successful. He ranked fifth. And he was very upset because the four people in front of him were all Swedes. So he was really upset over that. The following year, he became master of the sword at the polo club. Now you can appreciate with the money he had, he could do those things. Okay? And he was so good at it that they named a, uh, a saber after him, the Patton Saber. First action in combat was in 1916. He was on the staff of General John Pershing. He, his action was in New Mexico. The mission failed. He killed three uh, Mexicans. And this was the beginning of the war with automobiles. So he was right at the beginning. And his focus was on armored vehicles, tanks. In World War I, he became captain in France. He became a major a few months later. First officer in the U.S. Army Tank Corps, became an expert in tanks. Uh, 18 was promoted to lieutenant colonel. That's two steps away from being a general. Uh, tank battle at St. Mihela, tank battle at uh, Argonne, and it was badly wounded there. He received the Distinguished Service Cross for bravery. But when the war ended, he had to go back, and he reverted back to his status as captain. Now, I don't quite understand why that happened, but that's what happened after that war. Demobilized. Pardon? They demobilized. They demobilized, yeah, and then they brought everything back. They yeah. have 100,000 colonels. Oh, that's right, exactly, yeah. Pre-World War II, I love this picture up here, by the way. He designed that himself. It was a, it was a dark green. It was like a, an Irish green with gold buttons across there and a helmet. And the army refused to have anything to do with that thing. <laughs> and for his entire life, he was upset over the army for not allowing him to use that uniform for his tank command. Okay? Uh, he was a graduated army with distinction, colonel. 1940, that was the year before we got into the war, Brigadier General with tanks. And April 4, he was promoted temporary Major General, 2nd Armored Division. War began for us December 7, Pearl Harbor. He was organizing desert training in California with the tank command. So now we have him at, at December 7 uh, in the desert working with tank commands. 1942, America gets into war in Europe. There he is in the, uh, here he is over here, three star. So we're at, the, at this point, we're preparing to get into war in a big way, primarily in the Far East, but we were then talked into going after the Germans equally as much, if not more so, uh, by the Brits, because the Brits were having so much trouble. Now I want to digress a second here to introduce a guy by the name of Mussolini. This was the, uh, this was the Italian general who in 35 invades Ethiopia. In 40, June, Italy declares war on England, now an ally of Germany. In 40, in June 40 to September 41, Britain's East Africa campaign is against him and the Germans. Britain concerned for Egypt and the Suez Canal. Most important thing, February 41, Germany sends General Rommel to support the, in, uh, the Italy and Africa. It doesn't end until September of 43, two years later. The Africa battle begins, Britain responds. The African campaign uh, was a couple year campaign. And at the beginning, Rommel, who was considered the desert fox, which was a highly, um, who was highly recognized by the Brits for his campaign, for his strategies, for his success. I mean, he was given great accolades by the Brits for what he was doing to the Brits. And finally, they put in a commander by the name of Montgomery, this guy up here, to compete with him. And they had the benefit of Bletchley Park, which was the Enigma Code, where they had more information on the Germans, and they used it to their advantage. And the Brits and the Americans defeated the Germanies, uh, Germany in Africa. The Second Battle of El Alamein was the beginning of the end for Germany. They backtracked, and then at the same time, America was moving eastward in the northern part of Africa in Operation Torch. It was our agreement to uh, secure British victory in North Africa to help them. Uh, we allowed the American Air Mid Forces uh, to engage in the fight 
uh, to a limited scale compared to the Brits at that point in time. Here was the Operation Torch. This was the campaign. And uh, uh, my uncle, when he, when he came in, he came into this area right here in Oran. So I know that's where he was when this all took place. The first battle that the U.S. had in Northern Africa was in the Kasserine Pass. And it was a total, absolute disaster. The Germans humiliated the Americans, destroyed their tanks, destroyed their people. It was an absolute disaster. The troops were poorly trained, poorly equipped. They had no leadership. Eisenhower turns Patton into the commander of two corps. And on March 4, Patton was given command, writing in his diary, well, it's taking over rather a mess, but I will make a go of it. He grows in rank from 42 to 43. But when he pulled into the second corps, the two corps, Pat took over his soldiers and remember his initial compact when he said, every man old enough will shave every day, officers will wear ties in combat. And then he came up with about a foot in front of my face and he said, and anyone wearing a wool knit hat with a steel helmet will be shot. He was trying to get a little bit of discipline in the boys. And he did. Here was the first victory for Patton, El Qatar. And this battle, simultaneously with the Britons coming from the east to the west, uh, kind of cornered uh, Rommel and his group to the point where uh, the Germans lost, the Americans and allies won, the US could fight and win. They did a very good job. Patton was recommended highly. This is the kind of the, the, uh, the pattern here. This dark black line right here was the defense of the Allies. The red line was where Rommel and his team were trying to get through and they got destroyed right there. As a result, as you can see down here, the US Allies trapped about 250,000 Germans and Italian personnel in northern Tunisia, forcing the surrender in May of 1943. So Patton has come into two corps in North Africa, taken over a poor group and turning it into a fighting machine. And they participated in the Tunisian campaign right at the end of the African campaign. And he was very successful. And Germany re, uh, went, uh, excuse me, Germany was defeated in Africa and Rommel went back home. He left before that battle ended. And Montgomery was given high marks for his success, and Rommel, the desert rat, was sent back as a defeated warrior, and uh, Germany was out of northern Africa at that time. So then the next question is, what do we do next? Now, here's northern Africa with a line like this. That was all contained by allies. And the question was, the question was, where do we go next? I put down here controversy between US, Britain, and Russia. Here's what happened. The US, want, the US didn't even want to be here in Africa. Uh, they wanted to fight more in, in the Far East. But they felt they needed to help Great Britain win the African campaign, which was the first victory by the Allies at that point in time. The first victory after about four years. And so we did that. And the US did not want to go into uh, Europe through the underbelly. They wanted to go through a D-Day on Normandy. And they were preparing heavily for D-Day, which was June 6, 1944. So this is the end of 43. And Churchill was under intense pressure from my Russian counterpart, what the hell was his name? Stalin, jeez, I lost that name. <laughs> From the bad guy, Stalin. Stalin was getting heavily bombarded and defeated in Russia from 41 to 43 and was begging for a second front to take the pressure off of the Germans or take the pressure off of Russia by getting the Germans to move away from them to some extent. Well. The argument took place, Britain won out with the US, 
and they decided that the next step would be Sicily. Now here's where the fun begins. The Sicilian campaign was called Husky, okay? And here is the strategy that was to take place. They were, they were going to land in this area, in Gila and Sileta, and the British campaign was going to go up the east coast, this way, and here's Mount Etna right here, and they were gonna get to Messina first. The game plan was for the British to get to Messina first. They told Patton they wanted him to be a backup to him and go on the west side of the mountains up this way and just protect his flank going up like that. Well, Patton said the hell with that. So what did Patton do? Patton takes off going all the way up to Palermo. He takes over Palermo. He does a few little amphibious landings around some real uh, German, uh, heading, uh, uh, German headquarters and he gets to Messina about two to three hours earlier than Montgomery. Now that was a no-no, <laughs> but that was Pat. Oh, by the way, my uncle, here's the 45th right here. He ended up in Scoliti. So I know he was there on that day. Before they went into Sicily, Great Britain, with its wicked sense of humor, decided they would try to create a deception plan to have the Germans believe that the next invasion from Africa would not be Sicily, it would be Greece or Sardinia. I just did a presentation for the Village Club last week on this whole story in detail, which took about an hour. And it's one of the most amazing stories, and the movie just came out about a year ago called Operation Mincemeat. I don't think it quite has the impact that I think it should, but it told the story of how the Britons try to convince the Germans that the invasion would be in Sardinia or Greece, primarily Greece, and how they got a man. Uh, unbelievable story. Let's put it this way. How a dead man and a bizarre plan foiled the Nazis and assured Allied victory in Sicily. Who in war will not have his laugh amid the skulls? That's what Winston Churchill said. The plan was so bizarre and it was so unusual, you could put at least 10 million to one that it could have worked. But they found a dead man. They kept him alive for four months in a freezer. They created an identity. They created the people in an office they created love stories for him. They created stories from his father, had receipts from different hotels. And then they announced that he died when he was dropped off by a submarine, how in the hell this worked, I don't know, <laughs> into the Atlantic Ocean and the right spot at the right time and the winds and everything pushed his body up on shore in Huelva, Spain, and the Spanish picked him up, did an autopsy, didn't do a good one, because they would have found out he died of rat poisoning. But the conditions of rat poisoning, if you don't go to the extreme, uh, uh, the extreme evaluation of what happened to the guy, indicated he, was, he died of drowning by four to six weeks. Now there's a whole lot of story in between there that's unbelievable. He had to get the Spanish to agree. He had to get the Spanish to turn it over to the Germans. He did. He had to get the Germans to believe it, they did. They took it, the information, all the way up to Berlin, they did. And in three days, Churchill knew that the Germans bought it hook, line, and sinker. Now, the two guys that were in charge of all of this stuff didn't know it until the war was over because Churchill got the information from the Enigma machine, uh, the breaking of the Enigma machine, and he got it from the ultra secret. So he didn't tell anybody about it, but he knew three days after the Germans got it that in fact they bought it. And they moved Rommel with two divisions to France, or to, excuse me, to Greece, waiting for the Allied invasion in Greece. It's one of the most incredible stories of the war. So here's a simple plan. To see the Germans that the invasion is into, is, it, 
invasion of the southern Europe would be through Sardinia or Greece, not Sicily. Use a dead corpse to float ashore in Spain with documents for a commanding general in Africa that tells of the, the Allied invasion will be in Sardinia and Greece, not Sicily, and get the Germans to buy into this deception. The plan was conceived by a writer and a fisherman in a super secret group of 13 people. Churchill approved it. Churchill was totally involved in it. So here was the plan. Here's Sicily, right here. Okay? Excuse me, here's Sicily. This is northern Africa through here. Here's Greece. Here's Sardinia. Here's Sicily. They went into Sicily here. Rommel was sent to Greece to establish defenses for here. They had to remove, uh, they had to remove tanks from the Battle of Kursk, which was the largest tank battle in the history of the war. And they moved them down to protect the invasion by the Allies into, um, into southern Europe. So they took over Sicily. When they did at the end of that, Italy then turns coat and now is not working with the Germans, but has declared war against the Germans and now is working with the Allies. They moved then from here to Salerno, to Naples, to Rome, and there is Anzio right there, and then they moved up. I always have to put this in because Churchill's my hero. Everybody but a bloody fool would know that Americans or Britons would attack Sicily. That's what he believed. He thought the Germans were crazy, but the point is, the Germans were deceptive at El Alamein, at Sicily, and at D-Day. They were very susceptible, very susceptible to these deception plans, and they bit into them every time. So what is this one? Okay. 1743, Patton beats Montgomery to Messina after capturing Palermo and helps liberate Sicily. This is a horse race in which the prestige of the U.S. Army is at stake. And we got there first. And boy, did that frost a bunch of them. I point out again the 45th right here, and they went to, into Scolidi. 45th Division received a lot of acclaim and uh, I just wanted to put that in there from George Patton. This was a picture of him and Messina when they got there. And they got there, and this is a picture from the movie Patton. But they got there a couple hours early, and when uh, the British Army came in front of the Americans who were standing there waiting for him, Montgomery said, don't smirk, Patton. I shan't kiss you. <laughs> Anyhow, they had a real frosty relationship for the rest of the war as a result of that. Finish line was Messina. New York Times talked about Sicily being completed and moving on to southern Europe. Now here's what happened a few weeks earlier before they got to Messina. Patton is out pinning medals on all of the guys that got hurt, who were injured in these tents and these uh, uh, hospitals, these uh, miniature hospitals. And he's putting, he's putting all types of badges and awards on all these people who are hurt. And two of these guys in two different times were just over in the corner shaking like hell. And they couldn't, they couldn't control it. He had no idea what was that. He called them all a bunch of uh, crybabies and weaklings and nobody's gonna be crying in my army. You're gonna go right back to the front right now. Because he didn't understand, of course, what war and what the psychological impact was on people. But he slapped these two guys, and these were the two guys that he slapped. And the slapping incident in 43 caused him to lose his command of the 7th Army. He was supposed to lead the 7th into Italy. But because the feedback back home was so intense, they wanted him shipped back. I mean, American public was very, very upset with him. Eisenhower was upset with him, but not so much, but he had to be upset because of how the people were reacting. So he gets removed from the 7th Army, and then the 
army that he had was reconstituted into the fifth and marched into Italy under Mark Clark. And there's a long story about Clark going up to Rome that's quite interesting. But back to the war. England is preparing to invade the mainland Europe and France in 44, June 6, by, June 5, by the way, was the original date. They had to delay it because of weather one day. Where is Patton? Now, why did I ask this question? I asked this question because the Germans were following Patton every place he went. They really thought this was the leading commander for the U.S. Army, and that any invasion into mainland Europe could only be done with the leadership of Patton. There is no other leadership, there's no other commander who was as good a field commander as Patton was that they believed could do any harm to them. So they watched him closely. Again, Operation Fortitude was a deception plan and the, and the plan was to Convince the Germans of Calais, which is the shortest distance between Dover and mainland Fl uh, France, was not going to be the invasion. Uh, it was going to be somewhere else. And um, it was no, it wasn't Greece or Sardinia. It was that's a mistake there. Yeah, no, no. It was it was going to be someplace else other than Calais. But he wanted them to believe that it wouldn't be Calais. That's the important thing. That's a mistake. So on August 43 to June 6, the key thing here is that Patton was used as a decoy. He was traveling all over the Mediterranean to talk to troops and so forth and so on. He was then promoted to commander of the Army, first U.S. States Army group called FUSOG. I don't know if anybody have ever heard of that before, but FUSOG was a ghost army. And he was across just north of Dover with a full army of 100,000 plus awaiting deployment to Pas de Calais for the, the battle. And the Germans knew that it would be at Calais. They were absolutely convinced. There was a double agent who also was involved with this deception plan who was very important in this thing. But the two of them, with this army and with the deception, uh, convinced Hitler until about two weeks later that in fact Normandy was a diversion when in fact Normandy was the main invasion of Europe. Now if you take a look everything was plastic. They had plastic tanks over here, plastic trucks, they had plastic planes, they had plastic boats and every night they would go out there and they would turn them around and move them different places and then they would allow the German planes to get close enough to take pictures to see the movement. Then they had this communication system whereby they had all of the noise and of, a, of, a, of an army of noise going 24-7 as if this all was... There was one person in the army. That was Patton. <laughs> that was it. Again, here's Calais. Here, th this line right here and everything below there were uh, allies, uh, over a million uh, Americans uh, ready to uh, move into Europe. And Normandy was down here in the Cotentin Peninsula, and Calais was right across from Dover, right here. That was kind of the game plan. Here is the invasion plan, the five spots. Anybody been to Normandy? Yeah, okay. So you know what the five... Uh, the, the five uh, uh, attack area or zones are, and Patton was nowhere to be found there. But prior to that, well, let me stay here for a minute. The invasion was on June 6th, originally the 5th, but now the 6th because of weather, and they were able to gain foothold, you see where the green is, you know, within a few days. But this area over here was supposed to be taken in D-Day plus one, D-Day or D-Day plus one. It took them six years, excuse me, six weeks to get control of Khan. Six weeks. Montgomery hit that thing four times and they were rejected every time. That delayed Patton from doing an end run with his mobile group. So Patton's third army, 
he gets it, he gets his notification that he's going to get Third Army in January. June is when the invasion is, June 6th. He has to wait till August 1 before it becomes operational and he can take off. And he does. Face it, Third Army consisted of 8th, 12th, 15th, 20th Army Corps. 20th Corps remained under patent throughout his march. They went into Germany, was operational August 1. A total of six Army Corps and 41 U.S. Army divisions were under control of the Third Army. He moved at breakneck speed so fast that he got to the Rhine River and he had no more fuel. And the fuel was being delivered from Normandy in trucks. And they were running out of fuel because he was going so fast. And the other allies were behind him. And so Eisenhower decided, Patton, we've got to slow you down. Oh my God, was that something. He wasn't too happy about that. So he started stealing gasoline from Montgomery's group. <laughs> At the same time, uh, they had, he had to slow down and wait. He wanted to go into Germany fast. Now, these are two excerpts from his famous speech to the Third Army on June 5, 1944. I will read it, but I will leave out certain words. Oh, go ahead. An army is a team. It lives, eats, sleeps, and fights as a team. The individual hero stuff is bullshit. The bilious bastards who write this stuff for Saturday Evening Post don't know any more about real battle than they do about mm-hmm. <laughs> and we have the best team, we have the finest food and equipment, the best spirit and the best men in the world. Why, by God, I actually pity those poor bastards we're going to go up against. It gets even saltier. <laughs> we will win this war, but we'll win it by fighting and showing the Germans that we've got more guts than they have or ever will. We're not just going to shoot the bastards, we're going to rip out their living goddamn guts and use them to grease the treads of our tanks. We're going to murder those lousy hun hmm 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 by the bushel mm, basket. And all right, you sons of bitches, you know how I feel. I'll be proud to lead you wonderful guys in battle anytime, anywhere. That's all. That was his speech. At a high-pitched voice. Love to have heard that live. Third battle, third ba army. Battled all the way from Normandy all the way into Germany, and they ended up. They ended up in uh, in Dachau in Germany, right outside of Munich. His only battle that he ever lost was Fort Dorint. And Germany held Fort Built No Two, located five miles southwest of Metz, France, was a strategic nemesis impending. Patton's drive into Germany in late 44, perched high on a hill and with a 300-man garrison, the fort was well preserved. He did not win that battle. This was kind of the look of the battle and the, the kind of the defensive position it was in. It was on a hill and it was terrifically defended. The, the dark black lines here are what Patton did going across Europe, okay? And in one of the great military maneuvers in the history of military warfare is when he was south of the Ardennes Forest. And he was asked to go up and help relieve the 101 in Bastogne. Here's the Battle of the Balch, December 44, January 45. I got to tell you a little history first. Here was our line, our defensive line was like this, okay? The Germans moved all of these through here with Bastogne in the middle and made this bulge. That's why it was called the, uh, the Battle of the Bulge, okay? What they were trying to do, which was Hitler's last attempt to save anything from the Germans, was they were going to try and circle the British into Antwerp, take over the seaport, and keep the British and the Allies from dumping any of the uh, uh, military equipment or fuel or anything else at the seaport and still have to do it back at Normandy. And he thought if he could do that, he could delay them. Well, Patton is coming along this way, okay? And all of a sudden, he's going to go up this way. And within 36 hours, he helped uh, the, one, the 101st 
And this was the condition he was in. Clouds, snow, cold weather. He got so bold that he asked his chaplain to write a prayer to help him defeat the Germans. And this is the prayer. Almighty and most merciful Father, we humbly beseech thee in thy great goodness to restrain these immoderate rains in which we have been, had to contend. Grant us fair weather for battle. Graciously hearken to us as soldiers to call upon thee that armed with thy power we may advance from victory to victory and crush the oppression and wickedness of our enemies and establish thy justice among men and nations. When Patton asked him to write a prayer, he said, I don't think it's right if I ask God to you know, take care of us and not the other guy. Patton says, I have a close relationship with that man, so I know he's going to listen to you if you write a good prayer. So he wrote this prayer, and Patton was pretty pleased with it. So Pat Patton, among all the other military organizations, so the uh, US first uh, uh, Great Britain under Montgomery and a couple other ones that were fighting along that line, that defensive line, had the opportunity to say, we can go into Bastogne and help them. Nobody said anything except Patton. He said, we can do it in 36 hours. And they all said, you're crazy as hell. And he said, we can do it because we're trained to do it and they will follow me. And they did it. which is a lesson in leadership, by the way. So we made the move. And today, it's considered one of the great military maneuvers ever in military history of that move to go up to 101. Now, the 101 had a great general there at McAuliffe. When the Germans came in with a white flag and says, we got you surrounded. Why don't you just give up right now? And his response was, nuts. And Patton says, anybody with that kind of English humor deserves to be saved. So they went in to save him. Germany retreats across the Rhine. We're coming to an end January 45. OK, so here we are. He's come up from over here. He's come all the way over. And around Nancy, actually, his maneuver was down this way. He was south of Paris in Orléans. He came down to Dijon, and then he was heading back up. Well, at Dijon, the 5th came north this way and met him there. And my uncle met Patton for the second time, going into Germany. And so they met there, and then he started, the, the uh, Patton's moved up this way, and then they went up uh, north of uh, Strasbourg, which is here. They crossed over into Nuremberg, which was the kind of the what kind of headquarters I want to call it? The religious headquarters, the spiritual headquarters of the Germans. And uh, they were able to do battle there. Coming across here was a, a, number of great a number of battles in there. And then they moved south, and they ended up in Auschwitz. <clears throat> the war ends May 8th. Auschwitz was, excuse me, I kept saying Auschwitz. I'm sorry, Dachau. Dachau was about 10 miles outside of Munich. Anybody been to Dachau? Okay. The 45th was moving in that way, and the 80th Infantry was encountering strong resistance. Sometime later, uh, that's my uncle was the 180th. They, was, they were relieved, but the one group that got in there was the 45th Division, 157th. They got in there on April 29th. And what they saw, of course, was horror. The ovens were still warm. People were in boxcars, on the roads, on the streets. It was awful. And of course, you know the sign over the all bet muck free. Work makes you free like hell. This is a picture that my uncle had in his, um, in his box. And it has in there at crematorium camp of Dachau, May 45. The 180th got in on either May 2 or May 3. I don't know the exact date. But they came in two or three days later after the 159th. This was the original crematorium at Dachau, taken on April 29th. These are the ovens. These are some archival pictures 
of what they found. And Patton, who had been to two other previous camps, um, witnessed the same thing and uh, was violently ill, what he saw. And Eisenhower made uh, Bradley come in, Montgomery come in, and all the news media come into the camp, the witnesses, to make sure that someday people might say it never happened. He wanted evidence. And then he had all the people in the local community come in and bury the people. A lot of people died over that too. But this is what they found. These are pictures taken. My uncle helped, what little I know about it, my uncle helped somebody in the camp and they gave him a purse to bring home. It was of human skin. My aunt and uncle did, had no idea and they still have it. My grand, the, his son has it and I've been trying to get him to send it to the museum. I will eventually get him to do that but it's going to take a little bit longer time. There was a massacre at Dachau. The massacre was from the Americans shooting all the Germans. After what they saw, they were so upset and so sick, any German they saw, they wanted to wipe out. And by God, they did. Shot on the spot, 122. Killed in, by camp inmates, 40. Machine gun by Birdie, I don't know what that is. Machine gun, 346. Total executed, 520. Killed in combat, 30. I can't read that one. Temporary Escaped temporarily, 10 was killed then. So they killed 560. Buckner was ahead of the 159th. 157th, excuse me. And he, they were all up for it, court martial. But guess what? Patton says, I'm not punishing these guys. So he refused to punish any of them for what they had done because of what he had seen. He's ordered to Munich on May 8th for the surrender. Uh, then he's ordered to Berchtesgaden. Anybody been there? Yeah. Been to Eagle's Nest up in the mountain? Yeah. Well, he went there because they had reason to believe, and it was good evidence that they had, that the German headquarters and the German leadership would all return from Berlin to Berchtesgaden to coordinate the war from there and then disperse. Well, there was nobody there when they got there. But they were assigned there and they stayed there for a while. So he was assigned then as a military governor of Bavaria. He was ill-prepared and comments caused many problems for General Eisenhower. The Third Army suffered about 140,000, either dead, wounded, or missing. The Third Army killed, injured, or captured 10 times that, over a million people. That's what he had done. When did Patton lose the Third Army? Oh, more trouble he's in. He lost the Third Army in April of 45, and he was given the 15th Army, the 15th Army which was really a, a nothing army. What happened was he believed that if we're going to try and turn this country around back to some sort of normalcy, we've got to get the Germans involved with the, uh, all the environmental issues because they know where they are. Water, heat, electricity. Get them involved in trying to take care of the, 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 peop uh, the, the uh, community for the people. And he engaged that, and he was happy to do that. U.S. command didn't like that. They thought it was too much patronizing and they moved him and he made some comments that, uh, uh, that, the, that Eisenhower didn't like and so on October 1 Patton takes command of the 15th Army. It's his last command. So the war's over. He's in Eastern Europe and uh, really has a slough job in the 15th Army very depressed over what happened to him again. And he, uh, he finds out in two, two months later, three months later, four months later, I forget what the exact months are, three or four months, he gets in a car crash. 
He was headquartered in Heidelberg. They were taking a trip over to Mannheim to do some hunting. They came to an intersection and you had this car crash between a truck and the car. This was the car crash accident report. You can show how the, the car hit into the truck. During the accident, Patton struck his head on the glass partition in front of him. He was paralyzed from the neck down. I guess there is a dichotomy, you know? He went all through that war, all through the battles, then get killed by a car crash. His wife, Beatrice, was by his side during the accident until death. And uh, there she is here. Lady Army, they called her. And I forget how many days it lasted, but I think it was like a week or so. 11 days. 11 days, yeah, okay. 11 days, and then he died. And when he died, Beatrice made it clear that they did not want Eisenhower, they did not want Bradley at the funeral because of the way he was treated, they felt. But at the same time, Patton's wife put a curse on this gal over here, Jean Gordon, who was a niece of Patton through marriage, who was his mistress through parts of the war. And she said some pretty damn tough things. She said, may the great worm gnaw your vitals and may your bones rot joint by little joint. That's pretty vile stuff, baby, let me tell you. <laughs> Bottom line was, Gordon killed herself a few days later and pictures of the general were all around her. Beatrice herself died eight years later in 53 after falling from a horse. He was buried in Luxembourg. His funeral was in Heidelberg in a small church right in the downtown area. This was the church here. This is coming out of the church. He's buried uh, with his, I think there were 5,000 Americans buried in this Luxembourg cemetery. And uh, I wanted to see one more thing here. Ah. There it is. Is B. Patton buried with him? This is his burial site. There is a belief that after she died, uh, on a couple evenings late, they brought her body in there to be buried with him. So it's not certain, I don't think, but certainly is a belief that that really did happen. Here are some quotes from Patton. Lead, follow, or get out of the way. Accept the challenges so you can feel the exhilaration of victory. Success is how high you bounce. bounce when you hit bottom. That's a good one. We should have not stopped at Berlin. We should have pushed straight to Moscow. That was part of his comments that got him into a lot of trouble. I don't measure a man's success by how high he climbs, but how he bounces when he hits bottom. May God have mercy upon my enemies because I don't. And this, of course, was his white revolver that he carried with him all the time. Here's some photos of him that I thought you might be interested in. His great, his great friend during the war was his buddy Willie, the dog, who, was, who, who he believed should have been very strong and tough dog, but was really a wimp. Cat comes by, a little dog comes by, he'd, he'd turn around, cow tail and go under his legs. And it was funny, really funny. The Third Army freed Pilsen. Anybody been to Pilsen? It's about uh, almost an hour outside of uh, uh, Prague in Czech Republic. And it's to the, to the west. And uh, I've been there a number of times. And his, pa his uh, statue was there because he helped free the people while he was there. But he has statues in a lot of other places too. Okay. Pardon? Yeah, yeah. How old is the uh, check? Uh, well, I don't know when it was installed. I don't think Stalin would have allowed any kind of a That's interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. I've got to look that up because I don't know when they installed it. I do know while I was there a number of times, they had high praise. High praise for the guy. Many of you, if not all of you, have seen the movie Patton. 
I put this in here because my neighbor for 40 years is Colonel Phil Faris. And Phil Faris was in Vietnam two or three times and all over. But one of his friends was Patton's son, who was also a, uh, a colonel and then became a general in the Army. And Phil used to ask him, how real was the movie? Because, you know, it's pretty, pretty interesting. And he said, the movie is even stronger than the way he was. In other words, they, they really focused on how tough he was and they made it even tougher than what he really was, his son thought. Old blood and guts, his soldiers reverence to Patton. George S. Patton, four-star American general, World War II. Patton possessed a genius for war like few others in history. From all my readings, and uh, this is just one person's opinion, he was the great American field commander. Uh, one of the great leaders of men in war. His position was always forward, never an inch backwards. He had this capacity to lead his men who hated the hell out of him and called them blood and guts, but they would never fail him. They would never fail him. And there I was that morning with my uncle, so proud that I had read this book about Patton. <laughs> I know this guy. Yes, he, yeah. Yes, he's blood and, old blood and guts. I said, yeah, that's what they called him. And that was the end of the conversation until 2010, until I did the research to find out my uncle was under his command in Sicily and the rest of the war. This is really the end of the presentation, but I want to add one thing for you. This was a piece of paper my uncle kept with him throughout the war. And it's in that sheet over there. And I had it sealed up so it couldn't be destroyed anymore. But there is no glory in war and no beauty in the crusades of men. Man cannot survive except through his mind. He comes on earth unarmed. His brain is his only weapon. Animals obtain food by force. Man has no claws, no fangs, no horns, no great strength of muscle. He must plant his food or hunt it. To plan, he needs a process of thought. From the simplest necessity to the highest religious abstractions, from the wheel to the skyscrapers, everything we have comes from a simple attribute of man, the function of his reasoning brain. He had that with him throughout the whole war. As almost how, how stupid is war from man to man? and how over the centuries, war has been the only way to solve certain problems. And yet, through his eyes, through that whole four year period that he was in the, the army, um, this was in the back of his mind and then a sheet of paper he had in his shirt all the time. Let me say thank you again for being here tonight. I really enjoyed being with you, thank you. I'm open to any suggestions or any comments. Yes, sir. Uh, part of my ignorance, but I thought Patton took Mets. He took what? Mets. Mets? You were saying that the only battle he lost was at No, Fort, Fort Durant. That's right. Yeah, but one of his soul or one of his units saw an opening in one of the forts, several forts around here. Yeah, but the, he didn't. He he didn't. He didn't take the whole thing. Yeah, but it was the one impediment to him taking Mets. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And That's exactly. He, he took Mets, but he, he didn't take the fort. That is exactly right. Yeah, R very much. Yes, sir. You mentioned the inflatable tanks that Pat had. Yes. The state army. Yes. Said they were plastic. Sure they oh, rubber. 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 They were rubber. Absolutely. I said plastics, did I? Yeah. No, they didn't have that kind of plastics back then. It was all rubber. They were all made up in uh, New England somewhere. I forget where it was. There was a story on the, the women who used to work on them. And they didn't know what they were doing. They were making these things. They, they had no idea what they were. And they were shipping them over there and they were using them as decoys. So yeah, absolutely. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Have any conspiracy theorists talked the popular notion that because Ted knew that he was going to be paralyzed for the rest of his life, he trusted you to use an eye rather than down to more blood stuff? Bill O'Reilly's book throws a couple ideas about 
the, the possibility of uh, some funny things that happened to him or possibly could happen to him, some, some crazy theories about how he could have died, whether or not somebody came in and killed him because of what you just said, or was there some other strange reason? I don't know of any. I, I've, I've, I've not heard any convincing studies or stories about it. Every time there's something unusual that happens, there's a conspiracy theory behind it. The same thing happened with the man who never was. I mean, the theory about how this guy really wasn't the guy who was there, that there was somebody else he put in afterwards, blows my mind a little bit. But the, the point is there's always these conspiracy theories. It could have happened probably, but I doubt it. That's, that's the way I looked at it. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, but here's, here's the story. There's no question they got that guy. But they moved, him from, they moved him from London up to Edinburgh, Scotland, where he was to be put on this submarine, okay, in a special canister. Three days before that, there was a crash by an ally unit about five miles away that was kept quiet from the public. And nobody knew it during the war or even after the war what happened and there was significant loss of life. One of the conspiracy theories is that no, they didn't put that guy in, they got somebody fresher who just drowned and put somebody else in. Well, I, I can't see how they could do that because they didn't have any identification papers, they didn't have any, it, it just was too strange. And so the, that is the same reason I think that when you start looking at some of these conspiracy theories on patent, yeah. Nobody changes Yeah. <laughs> Not typically. No. Not typically, no. That's for sure. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. I, I didn't hear the final question. Well, here was the blessing with my uncle. He had a box this big. And there were papers in there and there were pictures in there of Hitler that were, and there still are, absolutely pictures with Hitler, Goering, uh, at the Berghof. I don't know where he got them. I don't know how he got them. He didn't talk to anybody. He was like so many other people who came back from the war that wouldn't talk to anybody. They didn't want to talk about the war. It was too much. Although during the night, my aunt would tell me that he would scream and yell and fly out of bed and just was just absolutely upset all the time. But they didn't talk about it. And my, my father and my other uncles wouldn't talk to him about it. I was the only one to talk to him about it. And I'm 17, 16, 17 years old. What the hell do I know? Except I read the book by Patton and I, and I jabbed him with it. But the way I did it, I took all of his information and took about six months to put it out in dates and then I asked for the 45th Division um, documentation. They have a book on the 45th Division, what took place during the war. And I was able to find him and find where the 180th was on certain dates, how they viewed it. And I was able to tie it together with some of the information he had. For example, on June 6, 1944, I have a postcard of my uncle at the town of Civita Vecchia, which is a seaport town of Rome and is a postcard to his brother. It's their dear John, I'm here, we're having a good, no, we're having a good time. We're, we're, we're doing okay, I hope you're doing okay. And it's dated June 6, 1944, where his brother gets it and gives it back to him and it's in the box and I know where he was on that date. And that date also was a place where I know he captured a German officer. And he brought back a Luger and he brought back a Sabre and he brought back hats and a whole bunch of stuff. I have the German Luger at home and I've shot it, okay. And on the description of the, the holster in German are four or five words. My son and I have researched every possible book on communities, officers in the German army, uh, anything we could come up with to try and identify where that was because I would be happy to give it back to the family. 
We can't come up with it. Nobody can figure out what it is. So when you ask, how can you do that? You'd have to know what division they were in, and what unit they were in, and start asking for the historical uh, research documents that they used after the war. Because it would give you a starting point to uh, do your research. And then if there's any evidence, there's one other thing that happened. I'll share with you with him. When he was in uh, Naples, they had a uh, couple months uh, rest period because the rains and everything, and the Germans were just north of them with a, another defensive line up there, and they weren't going to do anything during that weather. So somehow he was able, he or a bunch of his guys were able to save the life of a little boy. We don't know who the boy was. We don't have anything about him. But you know what we have? We have a note from the parent. And what we have is a little tin box about this long. And inside of it is a bracelet. And there are 12 little pieces of bracelet of stones. Each one of those stones goes back to a eruption of Mount Vesuvius. It goes back to the 14th century. And the writing from the parents say, we don't have anything else to give you, except we're so appreciative, we want to give you this. Now think about that. I can't, I, I can't even get my uh, cousin to, to, um, to let me have it researched and you know, tested. I mean, the cost, it's, it, it's, it's just an overwhelmingly uh, unique piece of artwork that I can't imagine what the cost is right now. But he left a lot of things in this big red box. It was just all thrown together. My aunt knew nothing about it. My, my two cousins knew nothing about what he did, how he did it, or anything. Uh, the grandson didn't know anything about anything. He didn't even know how his grandfather died or what had happened in war or anything. And so when I did this presentation, which was a good long presentation, because I followed him right from boot camp all the way through to the end of the war, um, they were just blown away, and they didn't know. And I don't know if you saw that last slide again, but there's a statement in there that I think it's really important if my knees won't give way here. <laughs> Let's see how I'm doing this. Here. There we go. No, I don't have it on this slide. Oh yeah, it's okay. Up on top it says, fought for his country, family, God, fellow soldiers, and a way of life, just like so many others. This is just one story of my uncle. There are thousands of stories like this man that aren't known today, you know? And that's a sad commentary that we don't have the, the book of all of them. And. Uh, Fortunately, I was able to go back and do some of his research. Any other questions? Yes, sir. They said it was a heart attack, but uh, I think it was the war. He was just never the same man. He was uh, always uh, been getting sleep, and uh, it just—I think it just got him. I think yeah, 55. 55. There was a pan back here. Yes, sir. Pardon? Oh, there's, there's truth to that. Both the time he was in England, the press picked up on what he said, and it was not supposed to be reported. They said there would be no reporters there. And the, the time he was in um, uh, after the war, the press picked up on saying that he wanted to take, uh, he did by the way, but he was misquoted in saying how he was going to take over Moscow and all this kind of stuff. And he, was, he reminds me a lot of Trump in that Trump's mouth just gets him into more trouble. Some of the things he did for the last four years when he was in, they're all good things, but he just keeps talking all the wrong things and it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. 
And that was what happened with Patton. He was the best field commander that Eisenhower had. He knew that. Bradley used to work for him in Sicily. Bradley was the one that was the field commander going into Sicily under Patton. And then after the Slapping Institute, Bradley got the higher position, the four star before he did. And so when he was in, um, when he took over the Third Army at uh, Normandy, he was reporting to Bradley, not to Eisenhower. And so there was a little problem there, but Bradley, Bradley was a different kind of soldier. I mean, he, he wasn't the field commander. He, he couldn't move the men like Patton could. And not, not, nobody could. And that's why the Germans watched him so much, because they knew that he was such a leader. And it was great that I think Eisenhower used him as a decoy on D-Day. Absolutely great, great work. This is a subjective question, which we don't know. But Eisenhower was having trouble getting his troops to move into Normandy and doing what needs to be done. Two or three weeks after the invasion, should Eisenhower have appointed Patton to Fort Hodges now? I don't know. If he was going to replace anybody, he should have replaced Montgomery, who took six weeks. He couldn't do that. But that's what he wanted to do. Well, Eisenhower did have the power to dismiss Montgomery. He did. But he didn't. He wouldn't have wiped out the whole coalition. Yeah, it would have wiped out the whole coalition. Yeah. Well, actually, yeah. Churchill said, I can find anything wrong. We're going to go ahead. Yeah. But yeah. Churchill did not like Montgomery. No, no. Well, actually, nobody liked Montgomery. No, he was, a, he was a pretty tough guy himself. Yeah. I remember, uh, uh, just as a sidelight here, um, boy, this must be in the 60s. Uh, there was that one television station on CBS. Uh, not Cronkite, but another one. Anyhow, they had an anniversary of D-Day, and they had uh, Montgomery and Eisenhower, two different places. And I heard Eisenhower just rip him so many times in that conversation. And I'm saying to myself, I didn't know much about it at that time. I said, what the hell is that all about? Well, there was a real rift there. Yeah. He just couldn't do anything about it, really. I mean, he could, but he, he wouldn't. Well, much like that, Montgomery could not keep his mouth shut. Correct. Well, he wasn't even supposed to be the uh, general of Egypt. The guy who was supposed to be got killed in a plane crash and only had left it. Yeah, that is right. I forgot about that. I forgot about that. Yeah. And he had a good setup because he had the Bletchley Park and the breaking of the Enigma behind him, giving him information about how to pre prepare his positions. He also had the sea lane. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The, uh, the Bletchley Park thing is another great story. To, has anybody been to Bletchley in Great Britain? Yeah. It's, it's a, on the outside. Oh, you haven't been into the museum? It was closed. Oh, too bad. It's about 60 minutes north of London on the Euston train, okay? And uh, you get right off the, the train, you walk across the bridge, you walk 100 feet, and boom, you're right in the middle of it. And this is where they broke the Enigma Code. And as it was told to me and to others, that during the Battle of uh, Normandy, that the Germans would have had a faster time getting information by contacting Bletchley than waiting for information coming from, from Berlin and their commanders there. But they were able to break the code so fast then. So it's a great place. If you ever get a chance, go to Bletchley. It's just a great, it, it just, it's so deceiving and so different because, you know, when they left in 45, 12,000 people were working there every day. And every one of them had to sign a document that they would not talk about this for 50 years. And they would not talk about anything they saw or did there. And that all the papers and all the equipment had to be burned or broken down. Fortunately, a couple of them kept a few pieces of information on the bomb or the, the, the machine that broke the code that allowed you to take the code and get a response so fast. And they've rebuilt it, and it's functional right now at Bletchley. Okay? But the, the key to that is nobody knew it was there. There were only three or four people that ever knew that 
Bletchley was where they broke the code. In fact, the people that worked there for four and five years never knew what they were doing. When they left, they were not allowed to talk to the person to the right or the left. They just had to do their work. And they were not allowed to talk about what they were doing. And only three or four people there had any evidence of what was going on. And every day, every day, uh, a box, it was called Boniface, a light brown box, with one key that Churchill had, was delivered to him in London. And he would take out the information, and then he would send it back to them, and then they would lock it again. Nobody would open it until Churchill got it again. But that's the way they did that. Now, it didn't last 50 years. Churchill's mouth uh, made a, 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 a faux pas about 87. When it was OK, but in 87, what the people were going to do with that mansion in this little Bletchley Park is they were going to tear down everything, all the huts, all the equipment, everything. We're going to level it and make condominiums. So the people who worked there said, you know, if they're going to do that, we ought to go back and have a party, at least. And we don't know what the hell we did there, but we'd like to go back and have a party, demonstrate what we did, where we did it, and so forth and so on. And the more it came out that they were going back to Bletchley, Churchill talked about Bletchley was the ultra secret. And that's when the employees knew what they had done. Now, as a sidelight, because we have a couple minutes, when I was there first time in the mid-90s, and they finally opened it up and there was nothing going on, but today it's fantastic. There was a book in the, in the bookstore, small book, wasn't written for any literary purpose, but it was written by a woman who wanted her grandkids to know what she did during the war because she couldn't tell anybody. And there's one paragraph in there that just haunts me. Uh, she said, my greatest disappointment in the war was that I couldn't tell my mother and father what I did in the war. And the mother and father died before she could even tell them what happened. And she wouldn't. They wouldn't. I'm not sure that that would be the same way in our country today, but they didn't embrace them. They realized that loose lips sink ships. And they would not talk about it. And so when that started to happen, I wrote to this lady, because it was an interesting book, but it was just talking about what they did. And I wrote to her and I said, uh, Dottie, I said, I'm writing you. I, I'm, I'm curious, but it seems to me that you have to be about 90 or 92 right now. And I hope you're doing well and so forth and so on. I wrote a real nice letter to her. She writes me a beautiful letter back. And her first line was, very British, my dear Frank, I'm afraid your sums were incorrect. I'm only 82. <laughs> oh, jeez. I mean, what a, what a way to go, right? So uh, about a year later, we went over and we met her in Oxford. And we drove down to Bletchley with her. And she coded for us and showed how everything took place and was a great, great tour. Her, her daughter came over. We met her daughter in London. Her daughter stayed with us and her granddaughter. So it's a family thing now. We've connected very nicely. Um, that, was, that was too funny from her, but she was, she was quite a character. She was quite a character. Pardon? There's a book that's very thick. It's called A Man Called Intrepid. Yes. It's about the, how, the, how the British got the big machine. Yeah. They stole it from Poland. That's correct. The three, three Polish guys yeah. were code breakers. And they, they had stolen the machine. And it was getting close to September 1, 39. And they were afraid that if they kept the machine, that th th they'd be in big trouble. So they called the British and the French, and they met in France. And they turned it over to the French. The French says, no, Britain, you take it. That's when it went to Bletchley. The, the two of the guys were captured by the Germans and were uh, kept in, uh, not tortured, I don't think is the right word, but they were kept in, uh, in jails and never revealed anything about it. Yeah. They were the big, in fact, at Bletchley, there's a major, major uh, memorial there for the, for the Polish people. A very big memorial there for them. Yes, sir? Did they have an incident uh, where the uh, 
Navy captured a German submarine. Yes. And they have the Enigma uh, book, machines and everything in there. And they had to take the submarine and, and all the people that were on it and they kept them sequestered until the end of the war. Yeah. And they, and they kept that secret. It's amazing. Yeah. The philosophy was every time Enigma was going to help the Allies with some battle or some information, that there had to be a second reason for the Allies to get to the point where they got to. Because they never wanted to give up on the secrecy of the, uh, uh, the Enigma machine. Now the reason, a question I always asked to me is, a reason they uh, destroyed or were supposed to destroy all the equipment and everything was that the British didn't want the, the, uh, the Russians to know what they had done during the war because they didn't help the Russians with the information they had. Truth in that matter is, the Russians already knew about Bletchley. So they had already known what was going on there. Pardon? They didn't know about June of 41. That's right. Uh, the, the only time Bletchley didn't work after they broke it in, in uh, 39, uh, 40, 41, the only time it didn't work was in the Battle of the Bulge. They didn't use it. Yeah, they, the, no, the Germans kept everything quiet. Because the only way in which the Enigma works is if there's a lot of key punching with Morse code, and it's over the air, and they take it out of the air. But they kept everything quiet. And so there was, if, if you see the movie, they talk about the, the, the success, if you see the movie Imitation Game, they talk about the success at the Battle of the Bulge. So that's the one thing that is incorrect. They did not break the code for the Battle of the Bulge at all until after the war took place. One last story and then we'll hang it up unless you have other questions, but when we talked to Dottie the second time we went over and we, we uh, we went to her hometown, Bodmin, over in Cornwall, and we uh, had some celebrations and so forth. She had a picture of a guy who in 1999 came to her library in Bodmin, where she worked as a volunteer. And the guy walked up to her and says, I've been looking for you for 40 years. I know who you are. And she looked at him and she says, who in the hell are you? <laughs> Come to find out, this guy worked in Eisenhower's headquarters in France and communicated with her directly with information for three years. They never met. So from that point in time, the two of them would go to the annual um, reunion at Bletchley where the queen would come up and award them with certain pins and recognition and so forth. And she did that for every year and uh, recognized them for what they had done. And the guy that made it happen, you may or may not know, was a guy by the name of Alan Turing, T-U-R-I-N-G. And he was never given the uh, knighthood because they don't offer knighthood posthumously. They did give him some other award beforehand. But what they did last summer, I think it was last June, his picture is on the back of a 50-pound note. For, and I would venture to say that most people will not know who this guy is, and, but what he did. And you, do you, I don't know if you know the end of the story, but he died in 50, when he was 55. I think it was in 55 he died. I think he was around 50 years old, but he committed suicide. And he was a, a homosexual. And Britain's rules at that time were you were going to prison or you were going to be chemically castrated. And he took the chemical castration, which really affected him terribly. And he wanted to do it that way because he wanted to stay with the machine that he had started to develop, which was an automatic information machine that could talk to one another and become artificial intelligence. That's where all the AI comes from today, was from his work on mathematics and his work on the Enigma machine. It all comes from there. So any other questions about our great General Patton? Well, thank you all. Thank you.